You're listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience, a podcast dedicated to helping executives train their sales and marketing teams to optimize growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. Let's accelerate your growth in three, two, one. Welcome everyone to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. I'm Carlos Noche, and I'm joined by my Can't Wait for Winter podcast partner, Lisa Snare. How you doing, Lisa? Carlos, I'm cold. <laughs> it's snowing and it's sun snowing out my window as we speak. It's not a sunny day here. Sorry, we're getting a little bit of drizzle, so, but it's still pretty nice. It was 40 this morning, so I, you know, I had to live with it. All right, back to business. Hey, today we're talking about selling without the pushiness of the stereotypical sales professional. Visualize this, if you will. We mentioned the word sales, and most people imagine a used car salesman. It's not a pretty picture. How can we change that perspective and still achieve success today? And we have an expert on this topic with us today. We've got Harry Spate, who is longtime sales coach and founder of Selling with Dignity. Welcome, Harry, to the show. Thanks for joining us. It's great to be here, Lisa and Carlos. Thanks for having me on your awesome podcast. Loving this. All right, Harry. This is how we start all our podcasts with this fun question. What's something that you're passionate about? that those that might only know you from, through business might be surprised to know about you. I love to cook. Yeah, I've been really passionate about cooking ever since diners, drive-ins, and dives came on the air. <laughs> and, uh, I became fascinated with cooking great tasting food. So yes, that's my passion. So apart from your passion with cooking, can you tell us a little bit about your background? What led you to where you are today? Yeah, I appreciate the question. So before I got into business, I used to do mission work. And my oh, wife wow. and I spent some time in some great countries like uh, the former Soviet Union, uh, Berlin, when it had two Berlins. And then we spent a couple of years in the Dominican Republic. And from there, I took my mission experience and became a salesperson because that connection is just very natural. And uh, a little tongue-in-cheek yeah. there. And, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <Okay. laughs> and then I got into sales leadership. And I realized that over the years that not everyone sold like me, which is coming from a place of service. And I decided after, during 2020, I said, maybe I can help others by writing this book uh, about selling from a place of service to help people who are not the pushy, obnoxious sales types. That is really interesting, the connection there as far as like, you know, your your mission background. Um, are you still involved in any of the organizations you used to work with? Nope. We are. Uh, we realized that our big mission was to raise three kids. And <laughs> at the time I was leaving that, um, I was reading also Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I have Which, that one here somewhere. Yeah, It's such a great book. But it helped me see my circle of influence was not nearly as grand as I once thought it was. You know, you go and change the world. And then it's like, I'll change myself, maybe. That's about all I can control. And so, yeah. So then we had kids and then uh, the rest is history because they take up your lives. Right, right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, uh, that was just a slight change in your mission. Um, so, so Harry, you've, you've started out in sales in the late nineties. Um, you know, how did sales work then? And, and where did this kind of, you you just mentioned that you sell a little differently. Um, and you know, don't come from that pushy car salesman mentality. So was it when you started out in the nineties that you really realized that that was different for you and, and what led you to, you know, writing the book in the end? Yes. Uh, one of the things before I got into sales, I found, I stumbled across this book in my sister's bookcase, which is called uh, The Greatest Salesman in the World. And in that book is written in, I think, 1968 by a fellow by the name of Og Mandino, who I believe, uh, I hope I'm not offending anybody, but I believe he had an alcohol issue, found God. And then he wrote this book, which was to me, incredible. Talked about the 10 scrolls, talked about service, love, perseverance, you know, all of these great things that I was familiar with. And I went, oh, I can do this. I can sell like this. And then when I got into a sales bullpen, which was the complete opposite of that, 
I realized it's like, wow, this is so different from what I thought it was. And here I was, you know, the mission guy never swore. And I'm in the sales bullpen, which there's a lot of adjectives I had not used since I was in high school. And it, it was just, it was comedy. And I really had to figure my place. Uh, and it took a while, but I eventually did and uh, did pretty well eventually. But it was, it was a long road for me. Anyway, it seemed like. So when, yeah, um, I can just imagine, you know, we've all seen the, the boiler room movies and, exactly. uh, <laughs> you know, that, yeah. <laughs> that well, type. yeah. I mean, so if you think of like, uh, even the movies, the pursuit of happiness with Will Smith before he went a little wacko, the people making calls, just dialing for dollars, we used to call it managers are kind of walking around, making sure you're making calls. And I, you know, it, this is just not what I anticipated it to be, but it worked. I was in a room with a lot of 20 somethings and I was in my mid thirties. So I was older than my manager. I was kind of like this, we're going to, we're going to roll the dice on you type thing. And, you know, it's just that whole attitude mentality. My, it wasn't really micromanagement, but there's a lot of management and it just didn't flow well with me. And it's not for everybody, but some of us who are, you know, you look for ways to improve and make the best of a situation. That's really what I needed to do. When you say, you know, pushiness, what does that mean in your mind? Because then we can kind of go back to like, you know, hey, you know, there's the best salespeople I've ever met, including myself probably, are not always the nicest people in the world. And the reason I say it that way is they're very protective of their time, right? So they, they, they might be a little direct at times. So how do you balance that out is what I'm ultimately going to go to. So let, let's take a step back. You know, what do you mean by pushiness? And then, you know, we'll, we'll work into that question. Yeah. So the pushiness is where it's uncomfortable for the buyer. Okay. I really don't like to be in a position where I'm uncomfortable as a buyer. So when salespeople are like that with me, I feel like I need to go away and probably not come back. Once you go down that path with people like me who are givers, we like to please people, we like to serve. If it's all about you as the seller, that's where a lot of us are not comfortable. And I've never been comfortable with that. And so, you know, like the overcoming objections, Carlos, you know, this, I used to get really good at that because I adopted some things and I decided that some things were not for me. But where you're, where a person can't breathe, everything they is raised for concerns slash objections, and we have an answer for it and there's nothing left, then it's like, well, so what's left here is for us to sign the paperwork. Some think that's a really good place, but sometimes it's not. It really depends on the person across from you. And if they're feeling uncomfortable and gross and they're being led down this path that they don't want to be in, then, you know, turning that into a sale or a long-term relationship is a challenge. I agree with you, Harry. And I like to call it, I'm in the raving fans business. Nice. So if you think about it, right, it's, I don't want someone just to buy our services or our products. I really want them to love them and become a raving fan to others, right? Because that's how so your good. business really grows. But let me take a step back. And when you think about salespeople in your world, Harry, are we talking more B2B? Are we talking yeah. software? Are we talking commodities? You know, what kind of markets are you usually expressed? Because that sometimes helps people kind of frame, you know, the salesperson we're talking about. Yes, I worked for a Fortune 500 company that sold copiers and their uh, first initial began with X. So when people tell me, it's like, oh, that would never work in my business. It's like, it does not get more competitive than that. And in my opinion, I mean, there was when I got started, I didn't start with that company. I started with a local dealership and then eventually things got sold, but that's where I ended up. Became a VP of sales. The, the whole thing about serving your client and serving your team versus the whipping, you know, morale, the whippings will continue until morale improves was the attitude of lo a lot of sales leaders. And I just said, no, I'm going to serve my people. I'll fall on the sword. I'll take the blame when we don't hit quota. I'll be a support for them. That's what I knew. I knew how to serve people. And that worked. We were like uh, one of the top teams in the mid-Atlantic, which is 
you know, pretty competitive area. A lot of people want to be there in Washington, D.C. So, yes, was it a commodity? A hundred percent. But there was also some services where people wanted to buy the support after the sale. So it wasn't just the product, but there was some value in the service as well. So there's a lot of different things going on at the same time. You had to view, like, so it's such a great question is because every sale virtually was different. So as a sales leader, I needed to get inside of what were we selling? Was Did the client or customer or prospect view this as, 100% commodity, they were shopping on price or was there value? Is there something that we could talk about post-sale that they would need? Could we bring up stories? And so we had a lot of things going on, which was a blast because every sale, every day was a lot of different things going on, which is a lot of fun for me. Core to Lisa and I's you know, businesses is this idea of people buy from people. So when you talk about you know getting, you know, we're with you, right? I mean, it's a it's a stereotype that salespeople have to live with. But the reality is, you know, it's people at the end of the day that are buying whatever your product or service is. So we're big on trying to make that connection. Any tactics on on how how do I do that effectively? Yeah, I I mean, it's really simple. I think is that you show interest in the other person. So, so I was talking to a person uh, recently who was in the car industry. And she gave me some numbers and about the data about the car sales and the challenges with car salespeople. And it's almost a hundred percent. It's the salesperson is saying, what do I need to do to get you in this car today? Right. We might've heard that once or twice. And they're even saying this after the person says, you know, things like I'm still going to shop around and whatever. It is like you did not even hear what the person said. So a simple thing that I believe is understanding what the buyer's process is, right? So if you're going to shop around, I'm going to say, I get it. I shop around too. I don't buy the first thing I see without checking out the reviews, checking out pricing, I do the same. So now you're putting yourself, I believe, on the same side of the table as the buyer versus it being confrontational. It's you against me and one of us is going to walk away the winner here. And when you have that attitude, it's really, it's like a win. It's not win-win, right? It's out of Stephen Covey's book. So make it win-win. Get on the same side of the table. Don't try to oversell. Be happy with building the relationship and letting them go do their thing, provide consistent value to them. Like maybe here's an article on shopping for cars. Here's something I thought of you and send them something else, right? Now you're building this trust factor. And when they come back and they, they can say, you know, Carlos, out of all the ones I bought, your price, I'd like to do business with you, but your price is a little higher. Um, is there anything you can do? That's where people will say another mistake is I'll match the price because they removed all value. And the better thing to do is to ask more questions. It's like, cool, I'm happy to work with you. Tell me a little bit about what you're finding. And now you've got stories. And then again, you're going to say, I can relate to that because I've seen, I, I buy stuff too, right? So when you show that you're a buyer, a human, someone that deals with the same issues, then it becomes much more natural. And now you're dealing with not the one sale, but Carlos, like you mentioned, it was this raving fans. And so now your opportunities increase with referrals, future sales, versus every time the person is buying a commodity, they're starting all over, new salesperson, there's no future in that. It's just, it doesn't need to be that way, is my opinion. What's your thought on that? Agree. Agree. I was just thinking um, one of the things that we talk about a lot when we're doing our workshops is we don't want to be a vendor. We want to be a trusted expert partner to our buyers. And so like you you said the word trust there, that comes, it's earned. It's not just given, right? So by providing the value, we build trust. We become that expert partner who, you know, like ultimately our goal would be to be called for things that we don't even do 
just because they want our right. advice, right? Like, yeah. so so that's the kind of level that we want to get to. And, and a big part of our business is asking questions. Like, uh, you know, um, gosh, I'm trying to, I'm going to butcher it, but it's like um, questions or uh, statements cause conflict, questions uncover solutions. Yes. Right? Yeah, and so like that's uh, one of our colleagues says that a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really the answer is that these questions and it's the tone we ask the questions. So I encourage people to think like if you have a question that you want to ask, we, we might say, like, why are you shopping around might be one of the first things. And, you know, people would get defensive and say, well, why will you be shopping around? Because I guarantee the lowest price or something silly. So. Instead of asking with the word why, why to me can be confrontational. And I'm, I'm like the anti-confrontational person. So everything is about peace and I'm on your side of the table. So when I started to analyze the word why, it's like, do I like to be asked why? Because now you're challenging me. So I think something is better is like I shop around too. When I shop, I'm looking not only for price, but I'm also looking for the support. I'm looking for this and that. Tell me. When you're shopping, what is it that you're looking for? Just so I can understand you better, right? Just so I can provide more value for you. And it's now people are going to say, well, geez, you, you do it. So now I'm more comfortable versus why are you doing that? It's like, yeah, none of your business. I, I don't need to tell you, <laughs> right? Where it's confrontational versus that trust thing that you mentioned there. Well, yeah. And, and I guess you're making them... Um explain themselves, which, yeah, I guess is uh, is another part of um, what makes you feel uncomfortable. It's like, why do I need to justify this to you? Like, I don't even know you yet. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so this is this uh, is funny because like people who are doing the financial planning, they will connect with me on LinkedIn or connect with me on a network thing. I and just then all of a sudden they, yesterday. Right. And all of a sudden you, they want to talk about your portfolio. It's like, I don't even know you and I'm not going to have this conversation with a complete that I just met yesterday that here's all my money. Yeah. And you tell me what I'm doing right or wrong. It's like, hello, there's, there's a better way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's uh, uncovering people's true motivation as well. Right. Like, you know, and, and in a non-confrontational way. So, yeah. so Good. we've been talking a lot about sales. I'm curious. Um, how could we apply this to other things? Like how, uh, knowing that your background was in sales, did you did you apply it in marketing? Yeah, it's a great question. And in fact, I could, I grew up in sales. That sales and marketing were supposed to, you know, have the I'm pushing my fist together here. Is that there is conflict because sales would complain about marketing that the leads were terrible, and marketing were telling complaining about sales is that we're giving you good leads, you can't close a door. And so, yes, I'm familiar with that, but. I've learned that really that you have to combine the two, get those two departments working together, make it one department if you can, and make it, I, someone coined the word smarketing, <laughs> where this, and I just love that, is because all of us who are in sales should be branding ourselves. We should be on social media as to who we are, what we do, how we serve people, taking pictures of our clients, promoting our clients, right? So now that people see us and they're saying, wow, that Lisa is constantly sharing information about her clients and promoting them, it's free advertising, right? So we have, all have this opportunity and the vast majority of salespeople do not do this because they look at that as they're not getting paid for it. So find the entrepreneurial salesperson that wants to make a career out of their sales. Those are the ones that are going to excel. And that also comes down to the types of people that are hired and so forth, which is a whole nother conversation. But you asked me a great question. I don't know if I answered it, Lisa, because I go down these little rabbit holes at times. No, I think you did. I, and I'm I'm also a big believer that one one cannot exist without the other. Like, you yeah. know, you, you, especially when you think about prospecting, like SDRs, BDRs, prospecting, that's a type of marketing, you know? Yeah. It's uh, so there's, it just should not exist one without the other. Yeah, some marketing companies are pure, purely making outbound calls. They call that marketing as well. So, I mean, it's it's like, I mean, to me, that was hardcore selling. When you're just making outbound calls and now that's smart, it's just, it's lead gen, you know, it's warm, it's 
raising awareness. I mean, there's a lot that's involved these days because I think you have to, because as you guys know, people are just bombarded with stuff and they can get stuff anywhere. And, you know, we've got to do a lot to find where there's a real need and people who are willing to listen to someone who is trying to get their attention. Not always easy. So Harry, look, so along those lines, on one hand, you could see individuals deciding, hey, I want to service other better. I like understanding my customers. I love this approach. On the other hand, since we're just talking about sales and marketing, but let's just think about leadership overall. There's, there's the leaders in the organizations that sometimes push their people in maybe the wrong direction, but they, you know, they're the tip of the spear as far as company culture. Have you found ways of how do you get the leadership of an organization, those leaders on top of marketing and sales to buy in on, hey, this is who we're going to be. This is what our culture is going to be. Yeah, it's not an overnight thing. I mean, I wish there was an easy pill to take, but there isn't. And if someone is really old school and they're just stuck in their ways, I don't pretend that this is going to work for them. And if people who are selling and they say, what I do is fine, I'm pushy, I don't care, I'm going to close everybody I talk to, that's fine too. What, what works for you is fine. But if you're trying to sell something that is relationship, a higher value product or service, you got to do something different today. The stuff that was done years ago, you're seeing the results. And if you're seeing the results are going downhill, the answer is not put more pressure on the buyer. The answer is not more beatings for my salespeople because it can be tough out there and you have to look at them and say, what is it that buyers are looking for in salespeople and in businesses today? Are they looking for just a product? Or are they looking for partnerships? Are they looking for something they can trust? You've got to sit around the table and kind of figure this stuff out because I don't think there's a lot of companies that are hitting their plans. Based on the numbers I've seen, there's a lot of companies that are way below their plans for salespeople. And there's a reason why. You can't just do the same thing over and over again, expect different results. I see you nodding. Carlos, what's your thought there? I, no, I agree with you. I mean, it's, some of it is just, you know, ec- economic times change, right? So money is not cheap anymore. So organizations have to tighten their belt a little bit and make a tougher decision to decide where they're going to bake their bets. So you really need to have a connection to those companies, not just have a cool product that they're buying. Yeah, and what I, yeah. we noticed over COVID is that when people started tightening their belt over COVID and everybody was worried, good salespeople were still hitting their numbers. Ones that were just showing up and throwing up were not. Because the same thing happened. Uncertainty jumped in the market and people were a little nervous about doing it. Things got a little bit better. And, and now we're in another pickle economically, it feels like. Uh, this is not a political podcast. But I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. As, you know, that, that one hopefully doesn't offend anyone. Pickle is very controversial. (laughs) (laughs) So with all this stuff going on, organizations, your customers are dealing with more today. So how do we engage with them in a way that wants, gets them to want to engage with us? You know, it's funny because some of the things we're talking about here is just plain old communication, right? How do we become better communicators to talk to someone to understand them better? And uh, something I got from marriage counseling that I never forgot was this line that that was told to us and that was, hey, that which is said is not always heard. And that which is heard is not always understood. And to have effective communication, you got to go back through that. And you got to take that to heart a little bit. Because if you're running and gunning so fast, pushing someone in a certain direction, you're not going to take the time. Lisa, you mentioned listening earlier, even from the questions, right? You're not going to take the time to actually listen to the answers and try to understand what the answers are. And sometimes, uh, you know, we try to tell folks, you're going to have to slow down and speed up. And the reality is you think you're going faster, but you're not. You're just kidding yourself. Slow down. Exactly. Make sure you understand why they would buy from you, why they're making this decision behind the scenes. You know, what's really going on in that organization? And to your point, it's not as simple as just asking the why question. You're really going to have to build some trust and rapport and have, you know, have a conversation with someone. Which leads me to this question. It's so good what you just said. There's tons to dissect with that one, but yes, 
Continue, sir. That's a good one. So flipping it already as like, hey, younger generations have a shorter attention span than ever. And they're not known as being the most patient communicators. So what do you suggest to the millennials and Gen Zers that are the largest percentage of their workforce today? How do they take this to heart? Yeah, that is a really good question. So what I'm doing now for all of you young people out there that are asked a question that you don't know how to answer right away is you kind of repeat it. So you say things like, that's a great question. So what are young people, what should they be doing today? is they need to be practicing everywhere in conversations. So if you're having a conversation and you're in sales, this is your livelihood, and you're complaining about that you're not making enough money, this is the opportunity. Become the best listener. That when your customer is saying, that they're going to shop around and all they get are salespeople who are selling and talking and then they get you and you're asking questions after they say something and say things like, tell me more. That sounds amazing. Or that sounds incredible. What else happened? Tell me more. And you just keep doing this and you're listening so that you can tie in the previous statement to your next question. This is a craft. This is not something that you just need to be a better listener. This is stuff you need to work on. You work on it, like you mentioned, Carlos, you work on it in relationships. You work on it with your parents, your roommates. This becomes, in my mind, your differentiator. And when I got into sales, when I started, because I, I, I did, I did this mission work and I had to be a good listener and people were speaking Spanish. I was learning. It wasn't easy. So I really had to listen still suck at it most of the time, but I'm, I'm getting better. Um, I hope the word suck is okay in your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the point is, is that I would go on sales calls once I got into sales leadership with other salespeople. And I'm like, so what'd you get out of that? It's like, well, they said they weren't interested or they said this and that. It's like, well, there's so much more, right? And so then you start going back and say, what do you think about, what do you think this meant? And when you analyze the calls and then, you know, eventually I'm just, Salespeople want to talk and they, they feel like they need to overcome objections. And just as soon as the person finishes their statement, the salesperson already with a 0.25 second delay, right? From the person ending their sentence or question to salesperson response. There's a great book, uh, Anthony Anarino book. I think uh, An Anthony Anarino wrote, um, something about the only sales book you'll ever need. He said, count, I think he said, count to four before you respond. Let it sink in. And when you, someone who is just like automatic in the responses, four sounds like eternity. But all, it's like every normal conversation does not need to be automatic. So when you can count and let it sink in, you're showing two things. One is that you're not a jerk. And two is that you're actually listening and you don't need to be so over or uh, so ready to respond that it's now a more relaxed environment where people feel a little more safe to tell you what's on their mind. Yeah, uh, Harry, one of my little tricks I try to tell folks is I try to take notes and then people go, like, with pen and paper? What are you, ancient? I go, well, first off, the brain works better that way because you're forcing yourself to listen, comprehend, and put it down. And it slows down the conversation. You know, you can think a little bit as you're writing stuff down. They stick better in my head. And, you know, oh, no, Carlos, I need to listen. I go, well, you're, you're not listening very well either. Because you all you're doing is listening to respond versus to understand. Yeah, you nailed it. And this idea of people not taking any notes, how do you possibly remember the criteria, the main points, what, what's urgent for the customer. I mean, it's like the server in the restaurant that you're asking for a few different things and they say, well, I want uh, an Arnold Palmer. Someone else wants a Diet Coke and they come back with three of the wrong out of the five drinks, right? It's just like, all you had to do is write down. It's, it's not complicated. We're not going to be offended. Take a couple of notes and those things will stand out later in your proposals and you're just revisiting what they said. The customer may forget what they said, by the way. 
Yeah. yeah. Right. So then you can remind them. Lisa, what's your thought? I'm nodding along, everyone, because uh, you can see my post-it <laughs> notes. But I'm ancient as well, and I tend to remember things so much better if I write them down. It was always how I studied in school. Like, I would rewrite my textbooks. So it was, you know, like, for me, that is the trigger. If I don't write it down, then, gosh, like, my mind's a sieve. So, so that, but I really like what you just said there about if you're taking the notes, it's like a whole other level of care. Right. And or or back to your point, service. Right. Um, because, yeah, you you joke about the server, you know, messing up your drinks or whatever. But it's like I would prefer you actually take this down. <laughs> and so our buyers feel the same way. Right. Is uh, it's a, it shows that we care. And there's I mean, of course, now there's the rise of all kinds of call recording software and all this other stuff. So, you know, maybe note taking is, you know, an older art form now. But um, but at the same time, we we send summaries of our meetings to our customers and they and we'll say, is there anything we missed, anything we got wrong here, anything you would change? And then when they get to reread and digest it again, then it expands the conversation because it's like, oh, yeah, I didn't mention any of these other four things. We should have talked about that. Yeah, that's really good. And so when you're asking them now, they're on the same side of the table as you are. Right? Yeah. It's a collaboration versus a sale. Yeah. And so when you're helping them get what they want, and again, this is you have the customer or prospect help you write your proposal is money. Yeah. They're not going to go with someone else. Exactly. Well, Harry, we could keep going all day on this because uh, there's also like 40 more questions I could ask you easily. Um, <laughs> plus, it just seems like we've got a similar mindset um, as well. But there's a couple of questions we ask toward the end of every podcast. And one being that, you know, having especially your unique perspective on sales, when somebody prospects to you, what really stands out to you uh, that might actually get you to respond to a cold email or a cold call? Oh, that they checked out my website or they commented on a post on LinkedIn. You know, when they, they go a little bit further than everyone else and say, your website has this on it, then I know that they did something. And I feel like I'm more inclined to respond to that than someone who asked me recently, have you ever considered getting sales training? And then someone else asked me if I ever considered podcasting. And then someone else asked me if I ever considered being an author. Oh, it's wow. like, hello, <laughs> all you have to do is go to my website, which takes 30 seconds. And none of those questions would have been asked. Yeah. So it's silly. It was what people are doing. And it's like, it doesn't need to be this complicated, folks. Agreed. And I don't know why it is lately. There's been like an influx of crappy outreach. Um, yeah. It's, I don't know. It's like, I mean, it goes back to the economic times. The economic times are bad. Pipelines are collapsing. So more crappy outreach goes out. All right. Last question of the day, Harry. We call Acceleration Insights. What's one piece of advice, be it business or personal, that you would share with the audience that would help them be as successful as you are? Yeah, I would say I'm going to go back to what we talked about earlier is work on the listening skills. Um, there is a great, great individual on LinkedIn named Colin D. Smith, C-O-L-I-N. And he is the master. Uh, I had him on my podcast. It's all about listening to me. It's better for business, better for your relationships, it's better for sales. Can't go wrong with being a better listener. That's some great advice. So... Harry, if anybody wanted to talk to you about your book or your your services, what's your preferred method of communication? Is it LinkedIn? Is it is it your website or? Yeah, LinkedIn is great, but I'm going to give them, uh, if you put it in the show notes, harrychat.com. It's my calendar link right now. But if you want a conversation, no obligation, just talk sales or a business challenge, first call is gratis. Amazing. So yeah, I'm happy to help people and just build the trust that way. Provide value. That's the goal. Well, that's a great goal. And we know how valuable your time is. So thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today, Harry. It's been great having you. Uh, it's been a blast. Thank Thanks, you. Harry. 
All right, everyone, that does it for this episode. Please check us out at www.b2brevexec.com. Share this episode with your family, your friends, your kids. Get them off their screens for a little while. And if you like what you hear, you can subscribe through YouTube, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. And you could do us a huge favor and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. I am Lisa Schneer, and joined by my never-boring podcast partner, Carlos Noche, we wish you nothing but the greatest success. You've been listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.